So let's talk about why Dante is important, first of all. He is considered the great bridge figure from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. So Dante is sort of the last writer of the Middle Ages and the first writer of the Renaissance. So he's very important for that reason. But then also, of course, this is an underworld journey. So it's in the tradition of Odysseus' visit to the underworld. And it's in the tradition of Virgil's visit to the underworld. And in fact, Virgil is his guide. So let's talk about this very famous first line. Midway in the journey of my life, I woke up in a dark forest. What does that seem symbolic to anyone in any way? Because this is a very symbolic work. Definitely being lost, and, but not in a good way. Midlife crisis. Like a lot of times in the middle of your life, people get what's called a midlife crisis. And they're like, where am I going? What am I doing? Oh, I thought I was going to do this job and I'm not satisfied or whatever. So he's basically he, he's saying that he's in what we would now call a midlife crisis. And he's afraid. And it, he was so afraid that even thinking back, he says, it makes me afraid. And this is actually uh, something we noticed, I think, in Virgil. When Aeneas was recounting certain things, he said, even to recount it makes me tremble now. And so that's a move that Dante makes a lot, and it's almost like, I wouldn't call it breaking that fourth wall in acting, but he's transferring the emotion from the story into his telling of the story, right? And he's supposed to suggest to you the intensity of that emotion. So obviously he's, so he's, he's in this woods, and a mountain lion blocks his way, and I think we've talked before about what a carnivorous cat represents, represents the force or somehow the danger of passion. So here we're meeting this carnivorous cat, like we met also in Pyramus and Thisbe. And then we have this encounter with Virgil. That turns out to be important because Dante says, from you alone I stole the noble style that brought me honor. So this person who is his idol it's urging him to do something. Virgil says to him, if you want to escape and get back out of this place you're in, you're being lost in this forest, you have to follow another path. He says, I will guide you through an eternal place where you shall hear despairing cries and see ancient souls in pain. And we, we go through the traditional uh, first five stages of the hero's journey here. First, we have the ordinary world. He's lost in this forest. Then he gets the call to adventure when Virgil invites him on this tour of the underworld. Then he has what's called the refusal of the call. He reconsiders it. He says, as a man who unwills what he wills, changing his plan for every little thought till he withdraws from any kind of start, so did I turn my mind on that dark verge, for thinking ate away my appetite for enterprise. So sometimes that happens. We get caught in a glutinous web of second thoughts, and we procrastinate, and we second-guess ourselves. And... Dante goes on to say, So many times a man's thoughts will waver that it turns him back from honored paths as shadows fool the horse that shies away. And then Virgil says, So that you may slip this worry and go freely, I'll tell you why I came and why I grieved for you. So that's the fourth stage, which is getting mentored, in which your fear is overcome by an older and wiser man, typically. So, for instance, in Star Wars, this is the stage at which Obi-Wan Kenobi comes and mentors Luke to encourage him to go and continue on the adventure. And then there is this fifth stage where you cross the threshold from the ordinary world into the special world. And that comes when they come to this gate. And there's an arched gate. And we see these very famous words carved there, or words which have since become famous. Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. And it would be difficult to overestimate how famous those words have become. They now stand for sort of a point of no return. Okay, so the first level of hell is for those people who basically can't make up their mind and don't take a stand at anything and never stood for good or evil. And I just want to compare that way, way back when we talked about Solon, Solon didn't like it when people didn't stand up for what they believed in or didn't make up their minds. And he said in one of his laws, Solon, in Athens, whoever refused to take sides in a political dispute would lose the right to vote. Solon didn't want people to attend only to their private affairs or wait safely on the sidelines to see which sign gained the upper hand. Instead, he wanted them to decide for themselves where integrity and justice lay. So here we see this same idea that 
Where Solon punished people who didn't take a stand by denying them the right to vote, God punishes these people by putting them in hell, but in the least painful kind of hell. So Virgil says, Here dwell the small-souled men. Their cowardice condemned these unnamed spirits to live forever without blame or praise. The world has no record of their existence. They commingle here with that choir of angels who, during Satan's revolt, sided neither with Satan nor with God. And their punishment is that gadflies and hornets constantly stung these miscreants who, in a sense, never really lived. So what Dante is saying is if you don't stand up and make a decision about stuff, in one sense, you've never really lived. Or maybe Thomas would say you lived as a person, but not as a human not in accordance with the best thing within you, the peace of divinity, your reason, which makes you a man. Okay, so in that same scene, we meet the ferryman, whose name is Charon, who takes these souls to the other side. And here again, we also get this metaphor of the leaves, which we got first in Homer, and then we got in Virgil, and then we got in Gildas, and now we get in Dante. At Charon's signal, these evil seeds of Adam threw themselves into the boat one by one, like autumn leaves falling from a tree. So again, these, the idea of these souls falling from a tree like leaves to represent the dead. Okay, and again, then below that, in the next paragraph, two paragraphs below, this device of the emotions leaking through in the telling, suddenly the ground trembled so violently that just recalling it soaks me with sweat. Okay. And then we go into people who just were pretty good, but they were born before Jesus appeared, so they couldn't be saved. And there we find Homer and Ovid and Aristotle and Socrates and Plato and Cicero and Heraclitus and Seneca, all of whom we've read. And this is kind of an interesting scene because you can tell that Dante really thinks these people belong in heaven because they were so great. But, through no fault of their own, they were born before Jesus, so they couldn't be saved. Which, if you think about it, really isn't fair. But that's the way this hell is set up. Then they go to this castle, and he says, We came to the foot of a noble castle. Seven high walls ringed it, encompassed by a flowing stream. We passed over the water as though firm ground. Then we passed through seven doors into a fresh green meadow. There we saw souls with grave eyes and postures of authority. They spoke seldom and gently. Now this idea of being in a green meadow, we saw that first in the Odyssey, and then we saw it in Virgil, and that's where the warriors used to be. Kind of like the Elysian Fields, I guess it was. And here in the green meadow, we see these intellectuals and writers. So in Dante's scheme of heroism, these are the heroes, these men of the mind. We drew away to one side of the plain to a place high and free with light, that we might see them all. There opposite upon the green meadow, Virgil pointed out to me the great souls whom I feel exalted to have seen. When I lifted up my eyes a little, I saw the great master of all who know, Aristotle, sitting with his philosophic family. Everyone gazed upon him, and all did him honor. With him I saw both Socrates and Plato, who stood nearer to him than the others, and Heraclitus. I saw too Cicero and Moral Seneca. So this is sort of like a beautiful dream, and I believe that this symbolizes the classical revival, which is already going on. It sort of began with Thomas Aquinas, and Dante is one of the big people who initiates it. And by putting these people in a place of honor in the underworld, they're not in heaven, but they're in a place of honor, and they're not being punished in any way, other than just be being aware that they are not in heaven. But this castle of the philosophers, it's basically saying that it's okay to honor these ancient people who we've forgotten about for a long time. So this is a huge green light to all the writers who come after that basically all these guys whom we've read in this book are in the pantheon and they're worthy of study and admiration, almost like saints, like pagan saints. Okay, there's this level of hell in which people are being blown around by opposing winds that clash, a forceful gale whirling them around, beating and smashing them. This place punished the people damned for lust. They followed their personal passions instead of reason. And these winds that th thrash them around drive them left, right, downward, upward. And here, who does he see? Dante sees Helen of Troy and Paris and Tristan and more than a thousand other ghosts who died because of their love. 
and their passion. Then I saw a man and a woman together blown about. And this is Paolo and Francesca. And this is a very, very famous episode because it's these two lovers and they gave into their passion. They're being blown about. Then Dante says, Alas, how many pleasant thoughts, how much desire has brought these two to this sorrowful place? And it turns out that what brought them here? We, well, one day we read for our pleasure of King Arthur's best knight Lancelot and how love enthralled him. And so they're reading this love scene from the King Arthur and the book and the writer brought us to this moment where they kiss each other and then they put the book down and they don't read anymore that day because they're too involved in each other. And this is the beginning of their sin. So we're also seeing here the idea in Dante, as we saw in um, Plato and Aristotle, that you have to be careful what kind of art or entertainment you consume because it could make you lead you to do the wrong thing or valorize the wrong thing, right? So, they go through a number of circles of hell, and then finally they get to the lowest circle, the ninth circle of hell. There I stood, with fear I set down these words. I saw souls buried in the ice, each of them looking like a wisp of straw under glass. So this is where the worst people are, and these are the traitors. And there, who's the worst traitor of all, Satan, who was the fallen angel in the Christian mythology, Lucifer or Satan, as you'll discover when you read Paradise Lost next semester, Satan was the brightest angel and God's right-hand man, but he decided he didn't want to serve God. He wanted to serve himself. So he led a rebellion of angels in heaven, and he got kicked out of heaven. And he's the great tempter of, of souls away from God. He has three faces on his head. The right face loomed in an Asian mixture of white and yellow. The left face lurked dark African brown. Now they don't say what the middle face is, but presumably it's white. So we've got all three races, Caucasian, Negro, and Asian, all represented here. So this is the idea of the universality of evil. It's not particular to any one race. I thought that was very clever that he gave three faces, one for each race, implying that no one is free of evil and the capacity for evil. In each mouth, his teeth crunched a sinner, grinding and chewing on him so that he could torture three of them at the same time. And you get these three sinners in there being chewed. One is Judas, who suffers the worst because he betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. With his head inside, he kicks his leg on the outside. The other two, with their heads out, betrayed and killed Julius Caesar. Cassius hangs from the Asian mouth, still looking strong. Brutus hangs from the African mouth. See how he writhes, but does not speak. Now, I found that extraordinary that almost as bad as the people who killed Jesus were the people who killed Julius Caesar. So this, to me, implies an incredible admiration for this great man of ancient Rome. And we see here the beginnings of this Renaissance adulation and worship of ancient Rome at its sort of strongest and greatest point, which some people would say Julius Caesar was the greatest man the most able man in ancient Rome. So we see how these people are starting up the Renaissance by transferring their affections to these old people who seem to them just really cool and really talented. So he finally, Dante climbs out, and there's an important last paragraph. Then we climbed out and looked up at the stars. And as I say, um, I believe that that is the last sentence of the Middle Ages and the first sentence of the Renaissance. Because this idea, we climbed out and looked up at the stars, fits what was going on because just then Europe had begun to climb out of the medieval era and into a world of glittering possibilities. So now we've left the Middle Ages and we're in the Renaissance. And so people in the Renaissance, the main thing is they didn't concentrate all their thoughts and their efforts on the existence that awaited them in heaven. Uh, the rise of trade and Thomas Aquinas's optimism about reason and happiness rekindled faith in life on this earth and interest in life on this earth. What other things were important during the Renaissance? You guys tell me. In, in the process of be, liking everything Roman, they became interested in all these ruins that they saw all over Italy, which they had previously shunned and feared as pagan ruins. Now they seemed impossibly perfect and beautiful. And where the 6th century Frankish king Clovis, after converting to Christianity, had burned the pagan shrines where he once worshipped, so now the Florentines, after converting to classicism, began to worship what Clovis burned. So they once again began to build with columns. Okay. 
So they discovered a new beauty in the world. Their painting improved, became more colorful, more realistic, and so forth. Okay, so now let's just go on to Petrarch, who in a way is not a major figure, but he's an important figure. He was a great popularizer of classical stuff, and he also was instrumental in rediscovering Cicero. He found in a cathedral library a copy of Cicero's letters to Atticus, and this was a big deal. It was a sensation at the time. So, and he he writes this rather touching letter to the spirit of Cicero. Of course, Cicero has been dead for 1,300 years or more. But he says to Cicero, Oh, how much better if you had grown old in the tranquil countryside, a philosopher reflecting on eternal life, as you write somewhere yourself, and not on this present brief one. In other words, reflecting on eternal life and not on this present brief one. Never to have cherished the trappings of office, never to have dreamed of triumphs, never to have inflamed your soul in the pursuit of power. So he misses what Cicero might have been if he just devoted himself to reading and writing and thinking, which is really what he was born to do. But instead he got caught up in all of this power stuff because he was a lawyer and he was a public man and a senator and he was, a, I guess, consul a few times. And so when Julius Caesar took power, he himself kind of never chose sides, just like um, the person that Solon condemns and that Dante condemns in the first circle of hell. So Cicero kind of, because of that, it didn't, things didn't end well for him and he ended up getting killed. So that's the substance of that letter. Then he writes to Homer, and I think that was interesting because he's pretending that Homer's complaining about how many people are imitating him. And of course, Homer, since he's the first great author in the Western tradition, is the most imitated and influential author of the Western tradition. And Petrarch says to him, you complain about your imitators, about those ingrates who filter your ideas and ignoramuses who besmirch your work. But you should have known as you soared on the wings of your imagination that you would have imitators. Rather than complain, you should rejoice that so many men wish to become like you, but so few can. But that was rather well put. Then, Petrarch says, you grieve that the ancient lawgivers esteemed you, while you, their Christian successors despised you. And you do not know why, but let go of your anger and your sorrow and take heart. Displeasing the evil and the ignorant proves virtue and genius. No one can free anyone from the mockery of the mob. Now that comes very close to saying that these Christian lawgivers were evil and ignorant. And I find that a pretty strong statement, almost a heretical statement. So we can see that Petrarch in this passage is positioning himself as no friend of Christianity. And I think that shows the beginnings of what we would call a critical spirit, a free spirit, someone who doesn't have a predictable or slavish or passive relation to his subject, but actually interrogates and thinks for himself, I like this part, but I don't like that part. And that implies a certain kind of honesty. And then the last paragraph of this letter to Homer brings to mind Something that a scholar named Curtius, a German 20th century scholar, calls the Logo Regnum, which is basically means the kingdom of letters or the kingdom of the word. And it's this idea that there's this kingdom that extends across time, which other people might call the great conversation, but it's this kingdom of people of all different ages who participate in this kingdom of the word. And... Petrarch is saying that he feels he's a part of that because he's speaking to Homer. He says, all these words I have spoken to you as though you sit here with me. Say hello for me to Euripides and the others when you have returned to your eternal home. So it's this idea that Petrarch and Euripides and Homer, and let's throw in there Cicero, uh, they all kind of live together in this kingdom. And I believe that that scene of the philosopher, castle of the philosophers, or that part of the underworld with the green meadow, where Dante met Homer and Ovid, and where the castle where he met Plato and Socrates and Aristotle and Heraclitus and Cicero, I believe that's the same idea of a logo regnum, or a kingdom, or a reign of literature and great books. And when we get to the second semester, there'll be a, there's a very famous passage by Machiavelli, which speaks to the same idea. 
So these people are now getting their identity as being part of a long line of writers. So this is really where this idea of the great book starts to come from. In the early Renaissance, where people felt that they actually were closer to these people who had been dead for more than a thousand years than they were to anyone who was still alive. These people spoke to them more than anyone who said anything to them in daily life. And that's the beginning of this idea of this great conversation or the Logo Regnum or the great books. Okay, finally the last one is, his, is Petrarch's letter to posterity. And he, he has this interesting line there. He's looking back. It's a little bit like Augustine's Confessions. He says, Youth deceived me and manhood corrupted me, but age corrected me. That is a very Latin sentence. That's probably like six words in Latin. So then there's this part that spins us toward what we're going to read for tomorrow, which is Boccaccio. And there's this idea of these guys who become super into literature and writing. They decide they're not going to be into women anymore. And it's not that they're gay. They just decide that women are a huge distraction to what really matters, which is all these great books. So, Petrarch says, In my youth, fierce love troubled me. Then as my 40th year approached, when I remained quite susceptible and vigorous too, I put aside the obscene act and all memory of it. I forgot I ever looked upon a woman. I count this one of my prime sources of happiness, and thank God who freed me still hale and flourishing from a servitude so vile and loathsome. So he's basically grossed out by the idea of being in love and kind of surrendering your identity and all your free time to a wife and all the wasted motion involved in being a bachelor, chasing women around and all that. And he basically said, I'm so much happier once I put that aside. So he's become like a monk, but rather than a monk for God or a monk for Jesus, he's become a monk for literature and writing and the great books. So we can see this idea of the great books starting to exert almost a religious influence on people. So deeply did I love liberty that I shunned whoever did not share my love for it. So presumably that meant all the women that he knew. Okay, so with that, we come to the end of Petrarch, who is, as I say, not a great or deep thinker, but very important as a man of letters and as a sort of model of what we now think of as an intellectual who devotes his life to learning and reading and writing for the sheer joy of it and for the sheer pleasure of being in conversation with other great minds.